great to be here with you. Uh, this is Ascension Sunday, uh, 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus ascended into heaven. And uh, this is the Sunday we celebrate that. We turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Let me just set the stage before I read the scripture. The scripture will be uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Uh, the disciples are gathered with Jesus, with the resurrected Lord, uh, in Jerusalem. They've been with him for 40 days. Uh, they have seen signs and wonders uh, performed. And they had been taught, read it in verse 3, been taught constantly about the kingdom of God, which was what he taught them constantly about uh, during the three-year ministry as well. We pick it up there in Jerusalem. He, Jesus is, a, is about to leave them. These are going to be his last words to the disciples. So, when they had come together, uh, they asked him, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time, is now the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were uh, gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men with white robes stood by them, a couple of angels, and they said, Men of Galilee, why uh, do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up uh, from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And of course, the next chapter, uh, he does. He descends. Uh, as he has just ascended, he descends as the Holy Spirit uh, come upon them. And then, of course, this looks forward to uh, the end of the age when Jesus will come again in power and in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have six scenarios I want to share with you and uh, see if you can spot what they have in common. Uh, number one, Emperor Constantine in the fourth century, the first Christian emperor of Rome, declares Rome uh, the Holy Roman Empire for Christ. One would think that's a good thing. There were many, many centuries of triumphalism, Christian triumphalism in the Western world because of Constantine. We were the big dog. We ruled things for a long time in the Western world as uh, Christians because of Constantine. Uh, he was a pretty warlike uh, emperor. He uh, waged war on those who had taken land from Rome when other emperors were in power. Uh, and he took the, the, the land back for Rome. He was good at that. He was also a paranoid son of a gun. He believed that his wife and his son uh, were conspiring against him. They may have been, uh, but he killed them both. Scenario number two. Moving on up to the, uh, the ten hundreds in the Middle Ages. Pope John the Twelfth. He was a lot like a lot of the other popes in the Middle Ages. Uh, he was more political than he was religious. Uh, he had an army and um, um, controlled uh, uh, massive territory, territories, very powerful pope, a very warlike pope, and a very murderous pope. Killed a lot of people, uh, and, um, and he was also known as a bit of a lecher. Scenario number three, um, <clears throat> the Crusades, the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. Uh, uh, Christians waged war in those three centuries to try to win back the Holy Land for Christ. Um, many of the Crusaders certainly uh, had good intentions. They believed that the Holy Land belonged to Christ and they wanted to win it back from, uh, uh, from uh, pagans. Uh, 
but there were other motives involved in that, according to historians. There were um, power and glory, a financial gain. There were a lot of mixed motives in that whole Crusades endeavor. Scenario number four. My great-granddaddy Powers. I didn't know him very well. I think I was about three or four, maybe, when he passed away. He was a good man, a good Christian man, very active uh, in his church, uh, a very well-read man. And he left his books to my grandfather, Powers. And then my grandfather, Powers, left all of those books to me. Uh, I was thrilled to get them and to uh, read through some of them. And there, were, there, were, there was a whole group of books that Grandpa Powers had left to us that um, I had never heard of before. It was about the British Israel movement. Now, the British Israel movement, which apparently Granddaddy Powers was in, Grandpa Powers was into, um, believed that the Anglo-Saxon race was uh, the descendants of a lost tribe of Israel. And they were now the true uh, uh, elect, the true people that the promised land would be given to. But the promised land, according to the British Israel movement, the new promised land was not in Israel, but rather was in the United States. And the whole, it was really kind of bizarre stuff. I read the books and did a paper on it in college. Um, but, <laughs> the, but apparently the Anglo-Saxon race was the chosen race, the, the, the uh, um, the new chosen ones of Israel and, and America would be the, well, the promised land and they would go and, and they believed in manifest destiny, that they were destined to take over this land. Uh, you know, and so it, it justified all the land stealing from the Indians and the Mexicans uh, that we did. And, uh, uh, and the Anglo-Saxons would be the ones who would rule over everybody and impose uh, their will uh, in their way on all others. It was, a, it was a bit of a racist sort of movement. Um, um, and there were a lot of those kind of movements uh, over the years in the United States. But I had never heard of that one until I got those books. All right, that was, what was that? That was number four. Uh, scenario number five. My dad uh, passed away about uh, five and a half years ago. And um, I took care of all of his, all of his affairs, and uh, so I would get all of his mail after he died. And, and uh, there was a particular church down in southeast Florida, and he, he lived in St. Augustine. Um, he and his, then his, his wife lived in St. Augustine, but they would go down to South Florida to this particular church, a large church, kind of a famous church, uh, for their music program. And so he got on their mailing list, and they would send all this mailing. And I, so I was getting all their mailings, and um, uh, their mailings had, had a whole lot to do with, and the church has changed a lot since I was getting these back five years ago. They've got a new pastor now. Um, actually, Billy Graham's um, grandson is the pastor of this particular church now, and he's taken them in a, in a new direction and probably a more positive direction. But the the, uh, the old guard, uh, they're very much into a certain style of politics. And, and so these mailings were talking about winning uh, America back for Christ. But when you start reading the details of how they want to do this and, and the kind of America they want for Christ, um, you realize that it is a particular brand of politics and they wanted to win Christ back from not just... Uh, Jews, Muslims, secularists, but also uh, other Christians that didn't quite believe the same way they did. And uh, it was a kind of imposing of their will, you know, on America. Or at least that's how I read it. That was scenario number five. Number six. A young, good-looking, charming, debonair, rather debonair, young uh, urban minister from Miami back in the 80s. Did, did I say handsome? Yeah, I thought, I thought so. Um, uh, he got caught up uh, in the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, you'll remember that in South Africa, uh, there was apartheid rule. In other words, the, the whites controlled South Africa. The blacks didn't have the vote. And um, uh, I, uh, that young minister uh, would... <laughs> 
would demonstrate out in front of um, banks down in Miami with others, uh, calling on people to not buy Krugerrands, uh, South African gold, to support uh, that would be supportive of the uh, uh, South African regime, and calling on the banks to stop selling the Krugerrands. Eventually, apartheid came to an end. Uh, Nelson Mandela was let out of prison, uh, was elected the president, Bishop Tutu, um, Episcopal, the head of the Episcopal Church in uh, South Africa, uh, was appointed head of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission where uh, he would bring people who had committed terrible crimes under apartheid, uh, bring them forward for them to confess, and then uh, they would be reconciled, they, they would be forgiven. He even forgave someone who had ordered his execution. Uh, he faced him, the guy confessed, and he let him go. Uh, anyway, this young minister got uh, really excited about all that was happening in South Africa and thought of South Africa, the new South Africa, as being the manifestation of the kingdom of God. He thought, man, this is just, this is like the kingdom come on earth. Then years later, he heard Peter Story, who was the head of the Methodist Church in South Africa, heard him speak in Orlando. And uh, Peter Story, who was best friends with, uh, with Bishop Tutu, they used to go around the country together and uh, speak out against apartheid. And he was also, uh, Peter Story was the, um, the pastor of Nelson Mandela. Um, a lot of people don't know that Nelson Mandela was a Methodist, lifelong Methodist. Uh, he said, you know, the danger for us is that we would, you know, because our friends are now in power in South Africa, the danger is for us to become prophets in the king's court. In other words, false prophets. In the Bible, a prophet in the king's court is typically a false prophet because they tell the king what the king wants to hear, not what God is saying to the king. And he says, that's our danger, is becoming prophets in the king's court to, to just bless everything that the government, our friends, are doing. And they are doing a lot of good. He says, but our role as Christians is, are, are to be prophets, true prophets, that speak truth to power, even our friends and to be critical when they need to hear our criticism. And so this young preacher uh, realized that, uh, gosh, you know, uh, worldly governments aren't the kingdom of God. So, what do our six scenarios have in common? Uh, some more uh, than others, but... Um, uh, all six of them have in common the fact that they get wrong the nature of the kingdom of God. Now, don't be too judgmental of those of us who may get it wrong sometimes about the kingdom of God, the nature of the kingdom of God. I mean, look at, um, look at the disciples. You know, what's their excuse? They were with Jesus for three years learning about the kingdom of God. That was the central message of Jesus, the good news of the kingdom of God. That's the central message. He comes to embody and proclaim the kingdom. And then after his death and resurrection, they spend 40 days with him learning about the kingdom of God. And then in our scripture lesson, they ask the dumbest question that you can possibly ask. When, Jesus, or is now, Jesus, the time you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Eh, wrong question. Now, um, throughout the centuries, uh, scholars have uh, commented on this and said, yeah, they, uh, it shows a, a misunderstanding of the kingdom of God, of all that they've, they've learned. Uh, Luther was really hard on them. He said, they, they didn't understand anything. John Wesley said, yeah, you know, it demonstrates a misunderstanding. John Calvin, really, uh, I've, I've got to read John Calvin's comment. It's, it's really harsh. Uh, Calvin said, the question is asked in the common consent of them all. In other words, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just Peter 
who typically ask the dumb questions uh, uh, in Luke's gospel or in Acts, but, uh, you know, it's not, you know, they don't just single out Peter. It's all of them ask the question, uh, when or is now the time that the, um, uh, the kingdom will be restored to Israel? Uh, marvelous, says Calvin, is their rudeness. And even though they were diligently instructed for three whole years, they betray no less ignorance than if they had never heard a word. Hmm. That's pretty harsh. I, you know, I think, I think a lot of the scholars are a little bit too hard on them. I think they probably did understand. Uh, they obviously did because they lived out the kingdom. Um, you know, after the day of Pentecost, they certainly lived it out. Um, but, um, you know, it's like, well, one last shot here. You know, maybe we'll get to be uh, rulers again, you know, that Israel will be uh, reestablished, the Romans will get run out of town. And, um, and they understood numerology. Numerology in the Bible, you know, numbers have significance, have meaning, have symbolism. They're, they are the 12 disciples representing what? Symbolically. 12 tribes of Israel. They will be, if Israel is restored to power, they will be the princes, the rulers of Israel. They will have power like Rome has power. But you see, power in the kingdom of God is completely different, completely upside down to Roman-style power. And so Jesus answers them and says, ah, it's not for you to know the day or the times of, of God, uh, but you will be given power, but not the kind of power they were hoping for. You will be given power to be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, the key word here is witness. What's a witness? The Greek word for witness, it's translated witness, is the root word for martyr. You will be martyrs be given power to be martyrs, to, be, to put your life on the line for the sake of the good news of the kingdom of God that you are proclaiming, you see, and embodying. Martyrs. We were hoping to be princes, not martyrs. But yet, they go on to live the kingdom. Now, what is the kingdom? Uh, the kingdom of God is humble, Loving, and those are actually the two most important words in summing up the way of the kingdom of God, humility and love, uh, the two characteristics of an early Christian uh, that, that was the most important, the most important characteristics of the early uh, Christians was to be humble and loving. Humility and love are the two most, most important characteristics. Uh, the kingdom of God is about justice, it is about healing grace, it is about, it is about forgiveness, uh, it, it's about peace. It has its roots in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, um, the Jubilee theme and the theme of Shalom all become part of the whole uh, vision of the kingdom of God. The Jubilee is seven Sabbaths of years, 49 years. At the end of that time, the 50th year is declared the Jubilee year. Debts are forgiven. Uh, people who've lost property get it, the property back. Uh, slaves are set free, indentured servants are set free. Uh, it's a way to keep uh, social relations relatively just. Uh, and then the vision of shalom, the peaceable kingdom, is a vision of reconciliation, of, of, um, of social justice, and um, uh, of forgiveness of community life, true community life. And all of this becomes part of that vision of the kingdom of God in the New Testament, also called the new creation. Uh, love, humility, justice, reconciliation, healing grace and power, forgiveness. Now, I laid out six scenarios of people who didn't get it. Uh, and the disciples, uh, in this instance, didn't get it. Uh, as a superintendent in the United Methodist Church, 
you know, I go around to churches and I see so much of people not getting it, you know, uh, people who want my way, people who think that being a Christian is about um, uh, imposing my will on others or on the church, uh, uh, about the church serving me, you know, I want it my way, I want to be fed, rather than me coming to church in order to lay my life down for the sake of of others. I see so much bad behavior uh, in the church. It, you, you know, you could become jaded. But what keeps me going are the, the folks who get it. Um, people in this church, gosh, some of your ministries where you're laying your life on the line for the sake of others, your outreach to the poor over across the street, uh, your handicapable ministry, much of what you do for others, where you get out of yourself for the sake of others, where you have the mind of Christ that's described in Philippians chapter two, the mind of Christ, which is humility, self-emptying uh, power, rather than uh, control or power mongering, a self-emptying, humble, loving spirit. You know, I look at um, um, the folks up in Holiday, just across the county line from Pinellas County up to uh, the next county, Holiday, Florida, in our district. Um, Community United Methodist Church of Holiday, uh, not very long ago, was averaging 800 people in worship. That community just went through a radical change, and they were down to uh, way less than 100 in um, worship attendance when I first arrived as district superintendent seven years ago, almost seven years ago. Um, that community was very poor, homeless everywhere. It's one of the poorest areas of um, the state of Florida. They held a church conference that I officiated, and uh, they voted to close as a church, to have their property gifted by the district to Metropolitan Ministries, uh, an outreach to the homeless. One by one, members of that church, many of them had been in that church their entire lives, one by one, they confessed a theology of the cross about how they felt called to die as a church in order to be resurrected to something new, something for God, something for God's poor and outcast. One by one, they expressed a theology that you just don't hear much in churches, an understanding of the cross, an understanding of the kingdom of God that you just don't hear enough of in the church. We gifted the property, Metropolitan Ministries, they're going strong, doing great stuff up there. And, um, and this small group of people asked if they could start a new church there on the Metropolitan Ministry property, and they were allowed. They're one of the fastest growing churches in the district. Um, in fact, they've pretty much outgrown their space there at Metropolitan Ministries. They're looking for new space. It's mostly homeless people that are joining, that are part of that congregation, also uh, a large youth group of uh, a lot of kids who are at risk. Some of them are in homeless families. Uh, there are even some kids who are children of people in the adult entertainment industry. There's one kid I heard him give a testimony about how he had uh, given his life to Christ, was baptized up there at Joining Hands Church, which is what we call it. Um, he was baptized, confirmed in the faith, and is going to go into the ministry. And his parents are in the adult entertainment industry and didn't really want that for him. Great stuff. People who get it. My last church over in Oviedo, Lily, was a Harvard-educated lawyer. Uh, she had a great job in one of the big law firms in Orlando. Uh, they took care of all the business of the international airport in Orlando. And in fact, she... Um, took care of a lot of that work, really sharp woman. Once a year, she would take a week off to serve in our church's vacation Bible school. She had young kids who went through Bible school, and so she wanted to be there with them, and she loved kids. And, you know, I could end the story there, and that would be a great example of somebody who gets it, you know, uh, by giving a week of, of her vacation to vacation Bible school. But that's just the beginning of Lily's story. Lily realized after a few years of this that uh, she was called not to be a lawyer but to be a teacher to work with kids. 
Uh, she quit the law firm, went back to college, got a degree in elementary education, and is today an elementary school teacher. She gets it. Getting out of oneself, putting one's life on the line for the sake of others, fulfilling the call of Christ upon her life. Now, that's not to say there, you know, that uh, shouldn't be a lawyer, you ought to be a teacher. I mean, I have another friend who uh, actually was a teacher uh, who became a lawyer. And um, she is uh, now a juvenile court judge. In fact, she was head of uh, juvenile uh, justice in the state of, of Georgia um, for a while. And many young people have benefited from this devout Christian woman who's given her life uh, to the law and to young people and helping young people. Uh, you know, and it's also not about necessarily moving from uh, uh, being rich to, to going to being poor, although it could involve that, like it did for Lily. Not poor, but at least not as much money as she was making in the law firm. But, it, you know, it could go the other way. Um, John Wesley said, the, uh, said, yeah, make all the money you can but then give away all that you can. Another person who gets it, Nathan, also from that church in Oviedo, sharpest young man I think I ever met. Nathan um, uh, was a brilliant artist, a brilliant musician, uh, brilliant in computer science, um, uh, went off to college at University of Central Florida, continued to help with the youth at our church and was real active in our church, but also got involved in inner varsity, which is a campus ministry, great campus ministry that gets kids involved in the inner city. Uh, he got married, and he and his wife and some of the other inner varsity folk after graduation moved into the inner city of Orlando into one of the toughest communities you can imagine group of us went to Nathan's house that they were, he and his wife were fixing up. And um, while we were helping them with it, we could see drug deals going down on the corner in the middle of the day. Tough neighborhood. Nathan and his wife got involved in the local Methodist church there, helping out with the children and with the music program, uh, living in Christian community there in the inner city with their, with their friends. Uh, they get it what this kingdom, this topsy-turvy, upside-down kingdom is all about. You know, thanks be to God uh, for people like you, for people like the folks in Holiday, for the people uh, that I mentioned, Lily and, and Nathan. Thank God for their lesson to the rest of us, to help us to understand this topsy-turvy, upside-down kingdom in whose power is manifest in love, in whose glory is revealed in sacrificial outreach. Thanks be to God.